What is going on, everyone? This is Dr. Josh Funk, and you are listening to the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Zach Baker of R2P and R2P Academy. And today on our episode, we have one of our residents, Dr. Seth Hawks, with us from our sports residency. And this is the one episode each month that we do where our residents highlight a research article that they had to review for that month in our residency program. These always follow the theme of whatever the month we are currently uh, talking about in regards to the body part or the injury or the different PT or rehab subject. This month being the foot and ankle. And looking through the article that Seth sent to me, I'm actually pretty interested in this one because it is on dry needling. And that is something that I have personally been doing uh, for about seven, maybe eight years now uh, in the state of Maryland from a physical therapy standpoint. Uh, There has always been mixed literature that's come out in regards to what is actually happening with dry needling. Are we actually doing something productive with it? Unfortunately, it is often very tough to quantify that, or if they are able to quantify it, the results aren't always overwhelmingly positive. So um, I still think that we're in the early phases of truly understanding what is the purpose of dry needling, what is the actual scientific rationale and mechanisms of what is taking place, but then more importantly, as a PT, if you know what is taking place or what the theory of the rationale is, What are the actual impairments that we're trying to address? Is it pain? Is it mobility? Is it muscle strength? Is it neuromotor control? And does that and how does that translate to patient care? So, Seth, do you mind uh, telling the listeners what was the uh, article that you chose for this month? Yeah, so the article I chose is called Effects of Dry Needling on Neuromuscular Control of Ankle Stabilizer Muscles and Center of Pressure Displacement in Basketball Players with Chronic Ankle Instability. Awesome. And then can you go into a little bit in regards to like what was the the background or the rationale of this article and then just the overall setup and design of it? So we know like with the background of someone that has chronic ankle sprains, anything like that. After that initial sprain, there's those anatomical changes with laxity, arthrokinematics, like synovial changes um, that can lead to those joint insufficiencies and cause that predisposition for recurrent ankle sprains. Um, And there's a wide variety of like altered feedback and feed forward mechanisms um, that have been shown with uh, CAI, Uh, but it remains uncertain really where that's coming from. If it's more of like a spinal neural issue, if it's more directly localized with the muscles. Um, And so this was kind of looking into the effects of dry needling um, short and medium term with um, attacking trigger points around, along fibularis longus and tibialis anterior, um, checking it through EMG to see immediate effects with activation amplitude with landing and like a dynamic landing. And then also that uh, center of pressure displacement on a single leg stance using a force plate. Awesome. So this is looking at if we have somebody with chronic ankle instability We know that there is going to be uh, potentially changes with, if there's been structural damage, laxity to that joint, there can be ongoing pain, there can be ongoing impairments with muscle strength or neuromotor recruitment. How are we activating these muscles? What is the firing time? What is the firing amplitude? And what does that look like in regards to how we carry out certain movements in daily life, but then also just in athletic environments? So looks like this uh, was a group of basketball players, 32 total, uh, over 18 years old, and they were split into two different groups. Uh, Do you mind going through and talking about a little bit of just who was involved in this study? And then what did the actual study look like? Like how did they implement this uh, EMG monitoring during their tasks? So with the eligibility for the basketball players that were involved, they had to have had at least one – Um, significant ankle sprain in the past, within the past year. Um, For it to be considered significant, they had to develop the signs of swelling, inflammation, and then it had to prevent them from playing for at least one day of the sport. Um, On top of that, they had to have a previous history of uh, recurrent sprains or feelings of instability. So at least two episodes of the ankle giving way in the last six months. Um, Recurrent ankle sprains involving the same ankle 
and then feeling that instability or giving way. They define that as the situation wherein during activities of daily living and sports activities, the subject perceives that the ankle joint is unstable and is usually associated with a fear of suffering and acute pain. Um, so the way that they had this laid out, they applied surface electrodes uh, along fibularis longus and anterior tibialis um, and synced the EMG signals with a video camera um, that was going or shooting at 1,000 frames per second. So the first thing they did with that was they did three trials of a single leg landing off of a 30-centimeter step onto a two-centimeter two thick rubber mat. Um, with pre-activation measurements obtained. And this was right before that first frame on the recording of that initial contact. So seeing if the muscles were turning on right before landing to prepare for it. After that, the um, subject would do a single leg stance for three trials of 10 seconds on a force plate. And on there, they were measuring the anterior to posterior displacement, medial lateral displacement of um, pressure. And the experimental group after that They had dry needling performed at the most painful trigger points along um, anterior tibialis and fibularis longus um, for 30 seconds after the first twitch response. The placebo group, they used a placebo needle that did not penetrate the skin but provoked a needle feeling. The handle on that needle moves to make it look like it's going in and out of the skin, but it actually doesn't. Interesting. Um, And after that was performed, immediately after... They did the single leg landing and single leg stance test again. They did it again 48 hours after the needling, and then they did it one month after the needling. All right. I like that's a pretty in depth study design. I like how it was set up. I like how they look at center of pressure. I like how they look at the landing, anterior tib, and fibularis longus. We've got the EMG, um, and they have that synced up pretty well. Million dollar question now. What did they actually find? Was there any improvement uh, with the needling group? Was there any differences between the control group and between the needling group? So, with the control group, there was no significant difference in the pre activation or uh, center of pressure displacement. Um, the outputs on them were exactly the same in all cases. With the dry needling group, there was a statistically significant difference both with the pre-activation and change of um, pressure displacement, both with p-values less than 0.001, so pretty significant. Um, and that was even at the one-month post uh, mark. That's awesome. So the, the control group had no change. And keep in mind, the control group got the placebo needling, correct? And, and that's always been my... My um, kind of pet peeve with controlled trials with dry needling is it's usually the control group doesn't get any needling, the other group does get needling, and there's a very definitive placebo effect happening of one group knows they're getting an intervention and the other group does not. This one, both groups were receiving some type of intervention, one being a sham intervention, the other being an actual one. So I I do think that is important to note, that the one group was going through the process of pretending to be needled, and they still had no change. So you start to, I don't want to say eliminate, but you start to mitigate the influence of the potential placebo or lack of placebo effect there. And then they looked at this one month post-intervention, and we're still seeing changes. And that's always been a thought of mine is, hey, even if I'm altering something on a neurological level or EMG level with an activation standpoint, is this relatively transient? Is it going to go away? Now, what we don't know is what were they actually doing from a rehab standpoint in addition to the needling? Um, And I'm not naive enough to think that everything we're seeing here is exclusively from the needling. I'm sure there was probably uh, some other things that were happening either within the study or just externally with the, the individuals on their own with strength and conditioning, doing PT intervention. But I love that this actually shows continual improvement beyond just the immediacy of it as well. Um, Seth, with this, were there any other conclusions that you could draw? Were there any limitations that they brought up or that you thought of when you read this? So when it comes to the limitations, um, the study brings up that they didn't include a control group of healthy individuals. So we don't know necessarily how, um, if the response would be the same if it wasn't someone with 
chronic ankle instability, maybe if it was just like the first uh, first instance of ankle sprain or any other type of like shin splints, anything like that. So we don't know if that would cause the same effect. Um, and it also was just with adult basketball players, not with the general population. Um, but when it comes to kind of what I've gathered out of this is, you know, spend time addressing soft tissue limitations, especially with those trigger points. Um, and if you're not, if the patient isn't displaying improvements in stability, then that's definitely something to tackle because obviously it does show that it, it helps. Yeah. And I think with chronic ankle instability, there's a variety of things that you're going to need to address. And I do think that we often either over or underemphasize palpation, manual intervention, and addressing some of these soft tissue components. I think there are some people that go overboard with it and they prioritize it too much and they do not do their due diligence with a proper stability and strengthening uh, routine following that or in addition to that. I also think that there's another group within our profession that they underemphasize or devalue the actual benefit of putting your hands on a patient. And they do a tremendous job with creating this program for them, but we may be doing a disservice if we're not also providing another intervention, some sorts of hands-on work, whether it's soft tissue, whether it's teaching them self-care, soft tissue strategies, or performing dry needling, because we're starting to see that what we are doing from a hands-on standpoint can directly influence what they're able to do from a muscle output standpoint. Um, I think with all things, it's a piece of the puzzle. But I do think that this article gives us a little bit more confidence saying that this intervention can be a valuable piece of that puzzle. Um, And I I was honestly surprised when I saw this article, I didn't know what to expect. I was a little bit nervous thinking, have I been doing something for the last eight years that maybe has been largely placebo effect and we have not been able to quantify objectively what we're doing? Um, And not to say that this is the end all be all from studies and that it's perfect, but it's one that's moving in the positive direction. I think what I hope it does is, hey, let's see what happens with needling with back pain. What does needling happen with upper quarter injuries, whether it's shoulder, rotator cuff, scapular dyskinesis, some of the things along those lines where there can be some movement abnormalities and there is also the presence of soft tissue impairment. So, uh, Seth, as always, thank you for doing the dirty work on this. Uh, This is uh, an article that, for me, um, I care about because it's an intervention that I do. Um, For those that do not needle, hopefully it just shows you that there can be a place for soft tissue interventions and potentially a direct relevance to somebody's ability to carry out more active interventions at a later point in your rehab session or plan of care. So, uh, Seth, thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing what article you choose next month when we get into the hip. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode or have been tuned in for multiple episodes, we would love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Until next time, thanks for listening.